come to me throughout this um, conference over the past few days have been invaluable, so, so I'm home right. So, as a region, Keith Ness was changed upon the 1934 announcement that it was the fourth chosen location for the UK Atomic Energy Authorities, UKAA, um, for their significant new project, the construction of a nuclear power research establishment. The site chosen was a flat former airfield of Dune Lake, which was on the coast and surrounded by agricultural land. Although in an area far from the decision makers and major population centres, it was in relatively close proximity to thousand. And as a result, the fact that it would have an impact on the town and the world was inevitable. This impact is the focus of my PhD thesis. I've just started my second year. In it, I'm considering the extent of this, uh, the extent of this change through the following research questions. What was Dunray's impact on the built environment of Thurso? How did Dunray shape the local community? What was Dunray's impact at local, regional, and national level with regard to the idea of the Highlands as an agricultural, rural, and wild landscape? All of which relate to the theme of this conference and present me with a multidisciplinary research challenge. So, first of all, placing Dunray in the landscape. Um, Dunray sits, as you can see from this image here, um, on the coast of Caithness, so across the Fenton Firth from Orkney. Um, I took this image when flying over to get here the other day. It's the first time I had the opportunity to fly over the north of Scotland um, and thought it was the best experience. But um, looking at it, sitting there just coming to the coast, it just it looks fairly insignificant and tiny, and I think that flying over the whole of the north of Scotland, you get this this sense, a different sense of perspective. Um, so if anyone's flying back, then I'm worried to look out, out the window, see what you can see down below. Um, now in focus, this paper will consider Junie's impact on the built environment of Thurzel, addressing how housing needs are met in a rapidly growing population. I will question how post-war policy affected planning and architecture in the area, the extent to which development was influenced by eminent contemporary architects, whether concession was made to the traditional architecture of Thurso, and the nature of the relationship between the UK, AEA, and Thurso Town Council. I'll address the role played by Thurso architects in Brooklyn Donald and Son and the UK, AEA, during a productive time for the development of housing, following the period of pre- and post-war planning, which influenced what could be built. Planning Acts in 1932 and 1947 dictated the protocol. The establishment of Dunway in 1954 presented the borough with a unique challenge, meaning that building needed to be done quickly and efficiently. <coughs> Although architecture was carefully considered, it was secondary to economics, which is unsurprising considering the scale of the project. What resulted was something which was a product of its time, erected quickly for a specific purpose, fitting in with post-war building ethos whilst also seeking to deliver the clean, rational community espoused by modernism, which was the dominant, dominant architectural trend of the period. This can be loosely defined as everything, quote, which historically has proved to be innovative in three aspects, either in the social context or the technical context, and or in the aesthetic context. So the nuclear programme was a government-led initiative in a period of state atomic optimism and expansion following the Second World War. J.B. Priestley, writing in 1947, considered it inescapable and said, it does not matter a rat what does not matter a rap what your work or your interest or your hobbies or your outlet may be, whether you are looking for sheep in the Grampians, rehearsing Torjak's cello concerto in Kensington, getting your trousseau together in Truro, making notes for a sermon in East Anglia, running a golf club in West Kent, or a repertory theatre in East Lancashire. You cannot, by any amount of wriggling, squirming, or running, put yourself outside the sphere of these talks. It simply cannot be done. We are now living in the atomic age. Priestley's, Priestley's sentiments reflect the atomic age as experienced in the far north of Scotland, 
when the region found itself at the centre of the government's drive for nuclear power. Caithness was undeniably distant from the hub of power in the mid-20th century, an agricultural area and one of the seven Protestant counties. Caithness was far removed from the centre of government, yet was at the centre of experimentation with nuclear power, not what you would expect from an area considered remote. The population of Thurso almost trebled from 3,350 to 9,190 between 1955 and 1964. This influenced the scope of the built environment, which in turn influenced the community and how it developed. The research establishment itself impacted on the landscape of an agricultural and sparsely populated local area. The firm of architects largely responsible for Thurso's mid 20th century development was Sinclair MacDonald and Son, the main practice in the farmhouse between 1889 and 1940. Post-war, it was therefore understandable that the firm was chosen to guide Thurso through the regeneration necessitated by both the Change Society and the Town and Country Planning of Scotland Act of 1947. Thurso was settled by the late 12th century and the town itself was founded in 1633. Expansion occurred in 1798 when Sir John Sinclair of Alpha <coughs> Um, laid out a new town to the southwest of this area of the area. This followed a rational grid pattern, a new style which had few, few precedents that grew in popularity in the late 18th century um, after the development of the planned town of Inver area. John Sinclair's work formed a solid framework of Thurzo, which remained reasonably static until the groundswell of the 20th century drive for housing. After the Second World War, this drive was a priority. In 1945, the Minister of Health outlined the government's proposal to treat the following two years as a period of national emergency when emergency measures must be taken and to prioritise housing over all other civil needs. To achieve these goals, non-traditional methods were to be employed. Houses built under these schemes were permanent with elements of prefabrication and used labour systems and materials not normally seen in house building rather than traditional materials like stone or brick. Um, materials such as concrete, timber and steel were used with approved type designs being developed. Speaking in 1949 at the unveiling of the first non-traditional Swedish timber house in Larva, uh, J.J. Robertson, the Joint Under Secretary of the State of Scotland, emphasised housing as the keystone of the regeneration of the Highlands. Impressed at the speed of construction, Robertson continued, I do not need to tell you what this means to the North in terms of stimulus to new industries and of new hopes for the crofters, fishermen and other useful people. It means to you something more important, that people all over the world will realise that the islands and islands are not dead, but they are still very much alive. Robertson's statement links the construction of new housing with the economic development of the highlands and islands, one follows the other. Industry would be attracted to areas with, a, with an incumbent population and housing would be built to accommodate a population of new employees for an industrial venture. Dunry was established within this context of island development. The Town and Country Planning of Scotland Act of 1947 enabled the consolidation of planning procedures and highlighted Thursday's privileged position as one of the two, um, two small boroughs in Scotland, the other being St Andrews, which had special case control um, over its own planning powers. Small town planning powers usually rest with the county rather than the town councils, but there is also existed that it had the capability of managing the process at a local level. This was of great benefit for what was to follow. David Robertson, MP, regarded the sighting of the reactor in Caithness as the greatest event that has occurred in the far north of Scotland and it will transform the economics of the whole region and stop our greatest affliction, depopulation. Rapid repopulation is what Thurzo had to accommodate. At the outset, Robertson believed that between 200 and 300 new houses were needed to house an expected influx of 600 people. This early estimate was soon surpassed and by the completion, 
of the housing program in 1963, 1,007 houses had been built and six purchased, making a total of 1,013 UK AEA properties in the area. The complexity of this situation relied on the formation of strong working relationships. That between the UK AEA and Thousand Borough Council was central to this. In the information pack issued for the press visit to January and May 1957, the UK AEA described its reception from Thousand Borough Council as warm and friendly, citing them as most cooperative. Reflecting this, Thousand's Provost John Sinclair said, I think the autonomous authority of Chiefs Council very well indeed. This high level of mutual assistance between the bodies was essential when a threefold increase in population meant that transport, infrastructure, schools, healthcare, retail, and other social and commercial requirements had to be addressed. Whilst the UK AEA had experience of transforming modest settlements into thriving autonomous communities, this was something never before experienced in Caithness. With previous development projects, the local authority of the area had constructed much of the staff accommodation, which then leased to the UK AEA. At the outset of the project, the question of who was going to build and acquire the properties and how they would be funded was keenly debated. The council could not afford to stretch its resources and was not set up for a big build, having, only, uh, having built only 40 houses per annum since 1949, revealing the slow rates of development in Thousel prior to the top announcement. In July 1954, the UK AEA opted for direct building through the Agency of Private Architects. Local knowledge was vital for the large-scale development of a borough which had previously only made changes which affected a reasonably stable population. Sinclair MacDonald and Son fitted this brief and project managed the construction activity helping to further enhance the community that it had been developing since 1889. But now, in the 1950s, the circumstances of having to undertake such an expansion within such a short period of time was unique. Together with the borough's long-standing planning consultant, uh, Rendell Govan, and the support, the support of the UK AEA's architectural team at Risley, Cynthia MacDonald and Son was tasked with handling the scheme. Ambitions were high, however, before the pledge of expert advice from Wesley was guaranteed. The UK AEA Industrial Group recommended that Professor Robert Matthew be appointed architect and chief for the project. Matthew was chief architect and planning officer at the Department of Health of Scotland before spending seven years as architect to London County Council. While in London, he masterminded the building of the Royal Festival Hall and oversaw his architects and world, world leaders in modernist housing design before returning to establish his private practice in Edinburgh in 1953. Other private practices were also under consideration, including Gless McKidd and Coya and Stratton Davidson Yates, two firms which had won Saltar Awards for housing in 1953. Basil Spencer Partners, which went on to design the new Thousand High School, published in 1958, was also put forward for consideration. All these firms were renowned architects operating within the modernist field, displaying the UK AEA's awareness of the significant Scottish practices of the period. What this also posits is the question of the great what if. Had one of the major firms been chosen, how would the urban character of the earth differed? A body consulted due to its familiarity with construction in the Highlands and Islands was the North of Scotland Hydroelectric Board, or NOSHA. Initially, the correspondence initiated by Noshev centered on matters of common interest. These related to the desire to correlate labour as both bodies were engaged in large construction programmes which had the potential to result in damaging, in damaging competition between the two authorities. The relationship soon turned into one of consultation and advice, with Noshev advising on the use of materials and supply of labour. It was dedicated to using local materials such as stone and slate in the construction of its housing, just as it had used them in its power stations. No shave architects Jim, Jim uh, Armstrong and Marcus Johnson recall that designs came to the office as little brick boxes, but Mr. Shearer, the chief architect, was convinced that for local communities to accept the hydro building, they would have to build in stone to link them to their local area. This use of local Materials was considered by the UK AEA 
and was something which no shed was keen to promote, even offering the services of its, of its housing society to fulfill to build the commercial week AE, AE houses in stone. The overall scheme of construction was based on the number of incoming employees and their marital status, with the UK AEA adopting a formula based on the assumption that out of every 100 people, 60 would be married. The suitability of housing for different grades of staff was considered from the beginning, and it influenced the levels of desirability of certain housing types. The polarisation between the types was summarised neatly by the UK AEA in a letter to, to the Department of Health of Scotland, as being of, quote, a better class type for higher managerial staff, and being a normal council type for the remaining eligible staff. Housing for the UK AEA was thus bound up with class distinction. This was most firmly expressed when discussing staff rates and the corresponding housing allocation, with the size and quality of housing increasing with grade. Housing was allocated for people moving to the area rather than staff who were locally based. The first contract awarded was for the construction of three bedroom timber C type houses. This was the property, property type analogous with the normal council type house. These were expressly for non-industrial staff lower than executive officer grade and industrials, essentially the lowest ranking for the <coughs> B-type houses for executive officer equivalent and above were of semi-traditional construction and available with three or four bedrooms. Those at E1 level qualified for a B-type with an attached garage. A-type four bedroom houses with attached garage <coughs> were offered only to banded officers in senior positions. These distinctions differ from previous allocations in other sites, leading to keen discussion, particularly around garages. It was deemed necessary to have a power in the far north, as it was expressly called, uh, expressly called remote by UK AEA managers. By the end of the building programme in 1963, were recognised estates of UK AEA houses had been built in Derso. Reflecting Robert Matthews' 1985 assertion, that the architect's task was to lay the foundations not only of a new architecture but of a new society. The houses were so grouped to, as to avoid complete unifor uniformity of type or size. This was so the new communities could develop according to social norms rather than managerial clusters. This chimes with modernism's dominant aim of the building of community, seen primarily as something new, hygienic, and rational. Miles Clinton takes this further. Um, stating that modernist patterns of architecture combine method and standardisation with a utopian search for community-based salvation. When phrased like this, modernism seems a very big ask. The UK AEA may not have achieved uh, salvation, but what it did achieve in terms of architectural impact and community development will all be drawn out in my future research. So in 1954, the priority was accommodating those who were due to arrive in July 1955. The first houses to be built were of non-traditional type, suiting the requirement to build the properties quickly <coughs> using materials which were readily available, as opposed to traditional stone or brick construction. <coughs> this was essential, considering the later decree that the housing programme must be achieved in order not to prejudice the schedule of the London Ring. The contract, the contract was awarded to W.J. Sims, Sons and Cook from Nottingham, which put forward an attractive design for a two-storey timber house. The success of the tender depended on the price, the aesthetics, and the ability to carry out the contract in the specified time. Invitations to tender were sent out to 17 companies across the UK. Despite the variety of responses, Houston Lee McDonald was keenly disappointed at what he considered to be a considerable lack of effort on the part of the Scottish firms many of whom, um, none of whom really compelled uh, comply with the specification. Sims, on the other hand, produced a house of considerable charm and character based on the basic plan and specification. He concluded that the attitude of the Scottish firms appeared to be that their own house was better than anything else that could be produced, and that unless the Atomic Energy Authority were prepared to take their product, they would not be interested. The build process was beset with problems during and after construction, and Houston by McDonald was unequivocal when addressing these. 
He was disappointed at the poor quality of the cladding and insisted that the back door be altered to open inwards as an external door opening out would be useless in this climate. The weather was a particular source of problems, and property was routinely taken in water. This was exacerbated in December 1935 when the wind was so strong that it was forced to open the doors above and below the locks and water was penetrating completely into the houses. Evidently, the fire now presented its own particular problems with regards to building, which, when coupled with the speed at which the houses were required, made this build a challenge. Despite this, Sims was awarded further contracts for Thursday Housing. It was praised indeed when the UK AEA's architecture branch stated without question that the only known firm to complete the programme in time, producing the standard of house required, was Sims. The timber housing was not without its critics. For the UK AEA, cost was first, consideration of the aesthetics was second. This is revealed in the gap between its intentions and what was produced, particularly with regards to the semi traditional housing it provided. The high tenders it received for the construction of traditional houses led to it considering a vastly increased number of timber houses for its scheme. The town council's opinion of this was clear. Thurso is primarily a stone built town. It has not been possible to build all local authority housing schemes of stone, but a determined effort has been made to use local materials as far as possible. Thurso has considerable civic pride, and I feel sure that the idea of a timber suburb would be met with dismay. This opinion was shared by the Times Provost, John Sinclair, and planner, Mental Govan. Significantly, MacDonald stated that it would be nothing short of a tragedy, and indeed a serious breach of trust, if the appearance and character of the town were to be altered by the UK AEA housing estate. This is a dramatic statement, signifying the high expectations of the local authority. So, in conclusion, the impact of the Dubai programme on the built environment of Thurso was significant. New states of modern housing were constructed, which doubled the size of the town and necessitated the extension of the borough boundary. This was achieved via careful cooperation by the UK AEA and the town council. The scale of this project was the first of both. In 1958 alone, 2,800 atomics arrived in the town. Post-war planning legislation ensured that this process was managed effectively, though it was not without its difficulties. Thank you.